Uh, this is Rick Farman. Rick Farman Tulane, uh, attended Tulane University and while in school in 1996 formed Superfly Productions with three friends. In 2002, Superfly teamed up with AC Entertainment and held the first Bonnaroo Music Festival in Manchester, Tennessee. Rolling Stone praised it as one of the 50 moments to change the history of rock and roll. In 2009, Rick Farman and business partner Jonathan Mayers were included in the Rolling Stone list of 100 people who are changing America for pioneering the greening of large rock concerts. So please help me in welcoming Rick Farman. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we'll get started. Um, my first question is about Superfly. How did you guys get started? So we uh, started our business here um, in New Orleans about 15 years ago. Um, and then uh, I was uh, going to Tulane and uh, just for a lot of years just re really interested in music and how it all comes together and uh, was playing in some bands myself as a sort of typical, you know, not really that good, um, but thought it was fun to be in a band. Um, and quickly realized that I think more of my passion was for uh, just helping people learn, you know, helping people learn about music and getting people onto music once they kind of started performing. And uh, I saw that a, a good friend's uh, band was playing over at um, Christina's so I just walked into the booking uh, office there and said, how, how can I help promote it? Um, and so that was really the first thing I did here. The person who was booking for Christina's at the time uh, was a guy by the name of Jonathan Mayers. And uh, the show that we promoted, the first one that I helped him out with, uh, did a lot better than he expected. And he said, well, why don't you come and help me kind of promote some more shows here? Uh, so we did that for um, about six months. And then some new people came in and bought the club decided that you know, we, we could go and do our own thing somewhere else. So that person that I was walking through his office uh, is now been my business partner for about 15 years. Um, we started promoting shows at different times of year uh, throughout the city, uh, primarily focused on Mardi Gras and Jazz Fest. Our first couple things were at the Contemporary Arts Center. Um, first year, uh, we did Mardi Gras and Jazz Fest. Uh, and then we started to do some other shows at various venues. So we went to Christina's, Maple Leafs, the Riverboat, really wherever we could find uh, space to do it. Uh, and one by one, we just started to you know, build a business from that. Um, in uh, 2002, uh, we launched Bonnaroo, which I, I, I assume and hope a lot of you guys know about. Um, and we were still based here at that time. Uh, and then uh, most recently, we launched the Outside Lands Music Festival uh, in San Francisco, uh, which just finished its second year. Um, since then, we've had a bunch of other events that have that have come and gone. Uh, and we do a few other things. We have a, a business that does marketing uh, for a lot of different companies. Uh, and we have a, a, a small management business that uh, manages the band Galactic and, and, and a few other projects. Right on. Um, well, you've been in New Orleans for a while. You were here since 1994. How has the music scene changed? How was it before Katrina, and how has it changed since Katrina? Do you think it'll be stronger than it was before, or will it be not as strong? Well, I mean, I haven't been living here really since the storm, so it's hard for me to comment a lot on what's happened post-Katrina. Um, I think that certainly one of the things that uh, hopefully is positive that, that's come out of um, you know, the storm is that there's, there's been a lot more national attention on New Orleans. Uh, I know I see it out there, and uh, it, it certainly should only be helpful for the music scene here. Um, and I think that uh, even things like the show Treme that's being filmed here for HBO, that's focusing on a New Orleans musician, and it's going to have a, a lot of local musicians in it. Those kind of things, uh, I think, are really uh, you know valuable opportunities. Um, in terms of the you know sort of market here for shows and events. I think it's a little bit more of a challenging environment for bigger events because you have a little bit of less population base. And you know, e even some of the venues that we used to use on a regular basis, like the uh, theaters on Canal Street, the Sanger and State Palace and Orpheum, uh, you know, aren't really up and running yet. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, I think, you know, a, a, a negative aspect of things. But overall, you know, I think if you're creating music down here or you're interested in, in the business side of it, I, I do think there's going to be probably even more opportunity here now than there was previously. Okay. Um, how has New Orleans influenced your uh, festivals? 
tremendously. I mean, you know, even really just the creation of a lot of the events that we had. You know, Bonnaroo for one. I mean, even the name is a word from a Dr. John album, Destinately Bonnaroo. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, uh, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, uh, along with some of the big fish events, along with some of the European festivals, was really the, the sort of sparks that got us to think about putting on Bonnaroo. Um, and, you know, we really still strive to, in a lot of ways, be as good as what we have here with the New Orleans mm -hmm. Jazz Festival. I mean, just the diversity of that event, how even the food uh, is such a part of it. Um, you know, it, those are all things that are constant inspiration for us. Um, and I think just, you know, one of the things that for us as a business was really uh, great about starting in this city was that, uh, you know, the rules can be a little different here. And sometimes, you know, when you're in a place like New York or LA and people say, well, this is how you have to do it. This is what the, you know, the, the rules are, so to speak. Um, you, you can get very much uh, tied to only trying to do things in a particular way. But I think because in, in New Orleans, um, you know, there, there's a lot of things here that can't happen anywhere else. There's a lot of, uh, you know, sort of different, um, you know, you know, there aren't as many people necessarily going out there trying to do everything. So it creates a little bit more opportunity. Uh, you know, those kind of things really, I think, still stick with us day in, day out, of just trying to think about different ways to do things. Um, I have a few questions about Bonnaroo. Um, you just finished your eighth year this summer. Um, congratulations on that. Thanks. Eight years. Um, has it become easier to plan over the years? Does it get more complicated? Um, well, there's a lot of things about it that are easier. Uh, just because, you know, we have this amazing team that has stayed very consistent, uh, and you know that collective uh, experience that everybody has. Not only you know the staff, but even you know the fans. We have a lot of people that come back every year. And for those of you who who don't know a lot about Bonnaroo, it's it's held on a 700-acre uh, farm about 60 miles south of Tennessee, and everybody lives there for four days. Um, and we've got you know, 13 different stages of music. We've got a huge comedy tent. We've got a 24-hour cinema, silent disco, all sorts of different activities, lots of different food. Um, you know, it's, it's really, we build a city, essentially, in this far, on this farm every year. I mean, everything that a city would have, like, you know, sanitation and, uh, you know, electrical systems and, you know, almost like a little on-site hospital. And, you know, you have you know, your security staff and, you know, so many different things that are, are comp complex logistically. And so they're, they're, from the staff side of things, to be able to do it repetitively each year with the same team in the same site makes it a lot easier. And also just for the fans, because now, you know, people who have been a couple times, uh, a lot of them are on the net telling people who are new to the event about how you do it. You know, if, if you've never been to a camping event, um, you know, certainly, you know, if you, if you do some planning and you do some communicating with people who have been before, uh, it can make your experience, you know, a lot better. Uh, and you'll know what to bring, you'll know what to expect, you'll know kind of, you know, how, how to manage your, your whole weekend there to make it as fun. So overall, it, it's, I'd have to say that it's a lot easier to produce the event, mm -hmm. which leaves us for, you know, time to do other things and develop other things. Uh, at the same time, you know, there's always the challenge of, uh, you know, trying to, you know, live up to your the expectations mm -hmm. of what you've already done. So you guys bought the land now, and it's uh... we did. Yeah, we purchased uh, about 650 acres of land. There's a little bit that we still rent. We're actually buying a little bit more right now, uh, and that's been a, a great thing for us. We were very fortunate to be able to do that. Uh, it's enabled us to start to put some infrastructure into the property, uh, so we can have better facilities and services for people. Um, and hopefully host other events there as well. Uh, it, it's, it's a challenging thing for us in that, you know, buying something like that obviously is, is expensive and it, it, and it ha comes with it a lot of responsibility. So, um, you know, we, we do our best to manage that. So is it up and open for business already? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, it's, it's, it's not the kind of property where you're just going to do any old show there. Mm -hmm. It has to be something that's probably going to do, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 people, a bigger type event, or it's going to be something that just needs a lot of land. Like we've talked to some people about doing like motocross there and, 
you know, mm -hmm. and especially because of where we are, like tractor poles and stuff like that, that just mm -hmm. want big open land. But, um, you know, overall, uh, in order to do another large scale event there, it's got to be the right thing. It's got to be something that fits, you know, what we think should be held on the property. And, and there's probably, there's not a ton of things out there like it. So in our dreams, maybe we'll have, you know, three, four or five events there annually. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, within your first few years of Bonnaroo, what, what were some of the obstacles and how did you overcome those obstacles? Well, you know, first and foremost, um, we were a very small company and still really are. We only have about, you know, 20 people that work full time with us. Um, but when we were uh, first, you know, creating Bonnaroo, um, we, you know, we were still here in New Orleans. We were, you know, maybe seven or eight people in our office we're over on, on Dublin Street, uh, Dublin and Oak Street. And, um, you know, not a lot of, you know, people in the industry really knew who we were. Um, we were all in our, our mid-20s, uh, had been putting on our Mardi Gras Jazz Fest shows and other shows around town, you know, for, for four or five years. So there were certain people who knew who we were, and we, ha we had a good reputation, but we were still a very small company. And the, and the biggest show that we had ever done was uh, a show at the, you know, basically State Palace Theater, which mm -hmm. was uh, 3,000 or 3,200 capacity. Um, so when we started to have this idea that, you know, there should be a big national camping festival and then there's nothing really out there like it, um, you know, we had to, to really put together a compelling plan and argument to people, A, why the bands would want to play there, why they should come together and do it, B, why somebody should give us money to help us produce it. Uh, and then, you know, once we were able to sort of get over those hurdles, find the right people with the right experience to help us put it together. Uh, you know, I didn't know a lot about, you know, what it would take to, you know, safely have that many people live for four days, uh, you know, on a farm in the middle of Tennessee. I mean, we, we just didn't really know so what is that we were doing in a way. <laughs> but what we were, the, the one thing I think we were smart about is we tried to find people who, um, you know, for, in our gut we felt were good people that mm -hmm. had the right experience. And, you know, listen to them. And we did our best to sort of manage the process of not, um, you know, letting them tell us everything to do, still taking our input, but at the same time uh, respecting, you know, people that were more experienced with, uh, than us and, and, you know, listening to their good advice. Uh, of course, you have the, the challenge of trying to convince, you know, a, a small town. The town that we do Bonnaroo in Manchester is, is a, about a town of 10,000. The county's about 50,000. Um, and, you know, it's a, somewhat of a conservative area. So just trying to convince them that we were, you know, well-intentioned and that mm -hmm. we were going to do things in the right way. And you know, I, I think a lot of the things when you're starting your own business, if you're in a band, if you're, um, you know, looking to get into the business, you know, it, it's real. a lot of the sort of basic tenets of what you should be doing when people don't know who you are or what you're doing are very simple. It's make a, con you know, a concise argument, you know, you know, back up what you're saying with some kind of, you know, evidence of this is going to work because this previously had wor has worked or these are, you know, um, specific things that somebody can tie on to. And, you know, you know, be a business that, you know, does simple things, return phone calls, you know, pay your bills on time, communicate mm -hmm. properly. When we first started in New Orleans, I mean, as you guys probably know from living here for a little bit at least, you know, there's a lot of that that doesn't happen just in terms of people not, um, you know, sort of, you know, being uh, being just generally straight up easy to deal with business people. Um, and uh, that, that kind of stuff really goes a really long way. So you guys started working with AC Entertainment to kind of put together Bonnaroo? Is that where they came in? Yeah, e each of our different events kind of has a slightly different partnership structure. So for Bonnaroo, we partner with a company uh, called AC Entertainment that's based in Knoxville. And uh, they produce um, a lot of shows throughout the whole Southeast region. They manage a, a bunch of theaters in Knoxville uh, and in Nashville. Um, really great company. Um, so it was great for us to be able to partner with a company that really knew that region, knew that area, um, mm -hmm. and, and had, a, had a good feel for how to deal with not only a lot of the local issues, but how the, the industry at large related to that location. Um, for our festival Outside Lands, uh, which is in San Francisco, and 
tell you a little bit about that real quick, um, just for those of you who don't know, but we launched in uh, uh, last year, we launched a festival in Golden Gate Park. Uh, so we, uh, it's, a, it's similar, probably more similar to Jazz Fest than it is to Bonnaroo in that it's not a camping festival. Um, but we have you know, seven or eight stages of music, really great food from the Bay Area, uh, a huge wine aspect to it uh, from you know all the different wineries that exist in, in Northern California. Um, last year we had Radiohead and Tom Petty, uh, Jack Johnson. This year we had uh, Pearl Jam, Dave Matthews. Uh, we had the Beastie Boys, but unfortunately uh, Adam Yacht got sick, so we uh, had Tenacious D um, instead. It was, a, it was a really great show, and and just for me personally, um, you know. <coughs> Well, we have a partnership on that event with uh, a uh, company named Another Planet Entertainment. And Another Planet are uh, two people who used to run uh, Bill Graham Presents. A lot of you guys know who Bill Graham is? Great for yeah. me. So, I mean, for me personally, you know, just when I first started getting into, you know, putting on events, uh, you know, and researching sort of the history of it, um, certainly, Bill Graham's like kind of the first guy, you know. Like that, his biography is amazing. You should, you, know, you should really read it if you haven't, if you're interested at all in in sort of how rock and roll business formed in the in the 70s and 80s. Um, and you know, so so the people who I'm producing this event with are um, you know really like the two people who helped him build his business. Um, so it's pretty exciting for me, you know, just to be in San Francisco, in Golden Gate Park, you know, producing this event with these people who have, like, put on all these, you know, legendary concerts and, you know, who really, like, learned, you know, f you know who, who, who kind of wrote the book a lot on how to produce events at a really high, cool level. Um, so anyways, that's a great event and it's, and, and it's a great partnership and it's, it's another thing that I, I'll say if you're interested in starting your own business you're interested in you know being entrepreneurial one of the best things uh, certainly that's happened in my life and that's happened through our, my events is you know the partnerships that I've had uh, you know first and foremost with my company you know, I have three other partners they're like my best friends we all you know went to school down here started doing this at the same time um, and you know it, it's just amazing I, I, I talk to a lot of other people who try and do things on their own and, and they hit a wall a lot, they get really frustrated that they can't get this or that done or they don't have any other perspective. And for, for us, we just constantly, you know, are, are able to, you know, balance each other out, our strengths and weaknesses. It's, it's really an amazing thing. So, you know, having people that you can really rely on and trust and that, you know, you can have a shared vision with doesn't mean you always have to have the same opinions, but it means that, you know, you can always sort of work through problems. It's really, I think, a, a great way to, to be successful in any career, uh, especially in something that's entrepreneurial. Um, for our events, Bonnaroo, as I said, we have a company that's based in Knoxville uh, you know, that helps us uh, understand that area for our, our event in San Francisco. You know, having a, a, a company that understands that area uh, is really beneficial. And as we go to launch other projects, that's, that's really how we do it as we try and find a you know, a, a local entity that really knows what they're doing to help us uh, figure out, you know, each different particularity of a new event. How do you guys select your, uh, your artist's lineup? And how long does that take to plan a whole festival, either Outside Lands or Bonnaroo? Um, Bonnaroo, for sure, and Outside Lands to a certain degree, is a 365 thing. It's not like, you know, because the event happens in June, we start thinking about it in January. You know, it, it, it really... Even the, the headline acts in particular, we're thinking about maybe even a year or two before, mm -hmm. you know, we're even really starting to go after them. A lot of it is trying to get, you know, their representatives, you know, like, you know, Bruce Springsteen's a good example. We had Bruce at Bonnaroo last year, and, you know, it took us three years to get, to make that happen. We had to have, you know, people from his team come down two years before that. His, uh, John Lando, his manager, his daughter came down, you know, two years before, you know, it's a, it, it's a really long process a, a lot of times to get acts really interested uh, at the highest level. Uh, we, we, in probably August, July, start to send out our first, you know, top 10 or 15 offers for artists. Uh, and then uh, right now, really, um, you know, from, from September 
to January, uh, we're you know constantly choosing the lineup. We have a, a regular weekly booking call that we do every Friday. That's a couple hour call, and there's a, a small group of us. It's uh, you know the five or six partners of the event, and then two or three of our staff that's on the phone every, every Friday, and everybody's just you know uh, making pitches about the particular bands they want to see on the festival. Uh, to a certain degree, we book it from the top down, but not entirely. And when I say that, I mean like the acts that are playing on the bigger stages at the more, you know, sort of key times. Um, but, you know, if there's an act that we really like that's going to be, you know, the first stop on Saturday, I mean, we'll, we'll book them right then. So it, it really is a, a year-long process. What's, uh, what's next for Bonnaroo? What do you see it in the future? Well, um, you know, we're, we, we, we feel a little bit that we're at a crossroads with Bonnaroo. Um, and and there's, there's two things that I think we'll see happen. One I know will happen. The other, we'll see. Uh, the first thing is that uh, we feel like Bonnaroo, uh, at this point, is sort of iconic enough, is established itself as, as a, you know, an event that people really should experience if they're passionate about music in America, if they're passionate about you know, being around people in a community with people that are really into music and arts and having a good time. Um, and, you know, we feel like just as in Europe, uh, and I don't know if a lot of you are familiar, but in Europe there's a huge festival scene, way, way bigger than what happens in America, and it's been going on for, you know, 30, 40 years. They, they looked at Woodstock, and instead of sort of, you know, enacting a whole bunch of laws that make it really hard to put on one of these things, they they looked at Woodstock and said, okay, well, now we're going to just do this right. And there are events like Glastonbury, uh, Roskilde, um, that, you know, have been going on for 30, 40 years that are, are, if you ever get a chance to go over to any of them, amazing things to experience. Um, and we feel like Bonnaroo is going to be that. We feel like we're going to be around for 20, 30, 40 years doing exactly what we do now, putting on a, a great festival that... Um, has all sorts of different, you know, entertainment there, um, you know, not just the music, but developing the comedy and the film side and all those things, totally immersive, four-day experience, you know, that we feel like is going to go on forever. The big question for us now is, can we do something with the Bonnaroo brand, with the name uh, and the, the goodwill that we have and the, you know, excitement around it and, and do something bigger? Um, and, and that's really what we're spending a lot of energy on. Uh, and when I say that, you know, really the game plan for us is to make that whole experience that we give people for four days at the festival, make that a, a, in some ways a year-round thing. So people are coming to Bonnaroo for, you know, music. They're coming there for comedy. They're coming there for, uh, you know, the different uh, community that we have there. They're coming in a, in a sense because, you know, we have, uh, you know, we're picking a... a a group of bands that, that we think, you know, people are going to really like, you know, that are going to be great to, to see live. Uh, so what we're going to try and do is, is really through the digital space, but through some other means as well, um, try and uh, service our audience, you know, with, with editorial content, with a, a community to be a part of, with, you know, creating uh, content that we think, you know, our uh, audience will like and delivering that up. Uh, all year round. Now, in some ways, that'll be through our website where people can come and, you know, get a lot of that stuff. And in other ways, it'll be through partnerships, through, you know, places where we feel, you know, our content and our whole brand should be. Um, and, and that's a really challenging thing uh, to, to sort of figure out. We, we just recently hired a firm uh, in San Francisco. It's a, a really interesting firm called Adaptive Path. Uh, and they actually, there's a book uh, that the guys who founded it wrote. I think it's under Adaptive Path name if you, if you search for it. And um, very, very smart people who uh, are, have done some really innovative stuff uh, in terms of you know, creating almost a network of, of you know, content and things that people can experience. Um, and so we're in the process of really coming up with a strategy to transform the Bonnaroo brand in that way. We'll, we'll see if it works. Uh, you know, like any endeavor, you know, there's usually a lot of reasons that people will tell you it won't work. 
Uh, I'm sure if, if you guys have ever had the experience yourselves of trying to get something started, whether it's a band or business, everybody's going to give you 50 reasons why it doesn't work. Um, but, you know, uh, you know if, if you listen to those, if we listened to those on Bonnaroo when we first did it, we, we never would have done it. So uh, we're, we're excited about seeing, you know, if we can transform this, this physical thing into, uh, you know, something bigger than that. So you've seen the music industry change since you came from just putting on a show and now now a festival and now you're trying to change the name and you know see what you can do with it and adapt to the environment. How have you seen, what are some of the changes you've seen in the concert, concert and festival production in say the past five, 10 years since you started? Well, certainly in the festival business, um, you know, there's a, a lot more festivals than, than there were before. You know, we, we were kind of on the front end of uh, developing the the sort of new wave of, of uh, American festivals. Of course, you always had things like Jazz Fest and the Newport Folk Festival and Telluride uh, Bluegrass Festival. Um, but you know, when we started Bonnaroo in 2002, uh, we were the first year as uh, Austin City Limits. Coachella was, I think, a year or two before us. Um, and then you know, there's been since then really a big explosion of a lot of others. Some have come and gone. And you'll, you'll continue to see other people try and launch festivals, and some of them will succeed, and you know, some of them some won't. Of them. Um, but it, it's a much different thing. I mean, I really wish that, like, when I was you know, in college going to see shows you know, all the time that there were big festivals to run out to, I, mm -hmm. I, I would have been all over it. So I think it's pretty exciting to be able to you know, ha have those options now because they really weren't available um, you know, more than 10 years ago. Um, so that, that's, that's a definite change. Um, when we first started uh, in the business, um, you didn't have SFX and, well, now it's called Live Nation. You didn't have that whole sort of conglomerate. <coughs> really what there were were regional promoters. Um, they were still pretty big, but um, you had promoters all over the country that might, you know, the big promoter in the southeast or the big promoter in the northeast or Midwest or whatever. Um, and what happened right around the same time we were starting our business is, th is that those uh, all got bought up by one c company and rolled up into this bigger thing. So, you know, what the effect of that has been is that, the, that a lot of that stuff has been a lot more corporatized. Uh, and, you know, for us, it opened up a huge opportunity, um, you know, in that uh, people wanted other types of experiences. They didn't want to just you know, go to the big corporate event or, you know, they wanted, and, and the artists wanted to work with different types of people. So that's been a, a huge change, um, and, it, and it has been pretty much beneficial for us. Uh, I think in music in general, and you guys I'm sure know just as well, not better than I, but, you know, the access to, to all different types of music is so easy right now. You know, um, and I remember, you know, that when we were first launching Bonnaroo within six months, I mean, I really remember that was like right when Napster came online and we were just sitting there downloading like every single piece of music we could, you know, because we were just so excited that this floodgate opened. Before that, it was really expensive to go buy music, mm -hmm. really expensive to, you know, access stuff and even just get a taste of it, you know. You'd have to like, you know, if go to a record store and if you're lucky, they'd have it on like a listening display before you bought it. Now it's like, you know, obviously uh, 180 <coughs> degree difference from that. Um, now I think that's really good for performers. I think the fact that, you know, the whole distribution model of labels and radio stations being sort of the uh, gatekeepers of what people have access to, I think the fact that that's gone um, is really good for the average fan, for the average musician, for the average concert promoter. I mean, I, I think it's great. Uh, do I think there'll be some negative aspects to that? Yeah, one thing is that there's so much out there that it's a little bit harder to A, get a lot of people into one thing, and it's a little bit harder to, for people to sh sift through the clutter of things. It's actually one of the things for, with Bonnaroo and the initiative that I was talking about before, why we think we have a really big opportunity to, for that brand to sort of mean something beyond just, hey, come to our festival, is because you know we, we hope that we've built up a trust uh, with people um, that they know, like when a band plays Bonnaroo, it's not, you know, it, 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 there's a reason they're playing Bonnaroo, that we've, that, you know, they've reached a certain level and that they're of a certain quality. And so hopefully we can be one of those solutions to help people, you know, discover music and sift through the, 
you know, large amount of stuff that's out there. But I, I think it's an amazing time right now for the business in general. I mean, some people, you know, can get real negative about it. I, 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 I'm totally the opposite. I, I think it's, it's an amazing time to be creating music, to be a music fan. I agree. Um, you mentioned Live Nation earlier. What do you think of the proposed Live Nation Ticketmaster merger? I mean, I, you know, selfishly think it's great because it, every time that things like that happen, it creates more opportunity for entrepreneurs. You know, it's just, it, you know, it, I think it's the, it's just the way it is. Whenever there, there are bad things that come with it and there are people that, you know, they'll, maybe there'll be less jobs for people in some way in the business. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe there will be, um, you know, jobs in the corporate world, uh, per se. M maybe there will be, you know, uh, a st on the higher end, some of the experiences won't be as good because it's going to be driven by certain corporate pressures and things like that. But uh, for, for, you know, entrepreneurs, I think it's great. You know, I think any time you, you know, make thing, you build these very difficult to deal with, not that great, you know, they, they're great ideas in a way. Okay, we'll put all these things together and then we'll have this big company. But when you're, you know, when it relates to an artistic endeavor like going to see live music or producing live music, you know, most of the times it, it doesn't produce a better product. The people who produce great product are people that are really passionate about it, that are on the ground level, uh, that really, you know, can understand uh, what, exactly it's like to be a part of that experience and from that perspective uh, you know I think it'll enable our company to continue to you know create innovative stuff that uh, you know those guys are just never going to think of never going to have the ability to execute on uh, and you know will be tripping all over themselves to even get going so mm -hmm. um, kind of a personal question what kind of music are you listening to now have you discovered any new artists yeah, I mean, we have a constant flow of new music in our office. It, it's, it's too much to keep up with mm -hmm. in, a, in a lot of ways. But we have some things that we, we do in the office to make sure people are staying in touch with a lot of new stuff. You know, I, um, I'm all over the place. I mean, I, I, when I was in college, I was definitely listening to a lot of experimental music, you know, everything from, like, Miles Davis and Ornette Coleman to you know, Fish and the Grateful Dead to, you know, every classic rock thing you can imagine to, you know, hip hop, whatever. You know, I now um, probably personally spend a lot of time, you know, listening to, um, you know, a lot of like world music, a lot of like one of my favorite artists is this guy Tumani Diabate. Um, he just did a record with Bela Fleck that's really killer. Um, you know, I, I find myself, uh, you know, definitely listening to a lot of bands that are just like just getting into the club level or above. Like a couple of things that I l listened to the last couple of weeks are uh, uh, the XX uh, Entrance Band, uh, Blind Pilot. Um, uh, what else? Uh, you know, and 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 they definitely have a, a strong, you know, sort of propensity to go back to, you know, <coughs> things like, uh, <laughs> sorry about that, uh, <laughs> you know, to go back to things like Radiohead or the White Stripes or, uh, you know, uh, I really like Jack White's new project, Dead Weather. I think that's cool. We had them at, uh, we had them at Outside Lands and it was the first time I saw them live and they were amazing. I mean, just like everything that guy touches is pretty much incredible uh, as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, yeah. Very good. Um, do we have any questions? Um, hi. I've been to Bonnaroo like three times in the last four years, uh, like 06 and then um, 07 and then this year. And um, uh, first I just want to thank you like going in 2006 really inspired me to like want to do concert promotion and specifically like festivals and stuff um, and what really struck me like the first year I went is how like you said you have this relationship with the fans I remember like coming in you get like a CD with like different like artists like that are playing at Bonner and just singles that you can listen to and, and different like 
and there's like a guide that's got like you know information like more information than you even need but it's like it's really good because it shows that you guys really care about the fans um and i've studied like the lineup a lot and i've like there's been this progression like as you know from like the beginning it was really kind of like jam heavy like <coughs> you know like widespread panic played like almost every year and like all these different like like jam bands and that kind of I feel like attracted like a certain like fan base and um, even since like the last th like the difference between going in 06 and then going this year it's I feel like Bonnaroo has gotten like a lot bigger and like you were saying that it's kind of like entered the lexicon and it's become like more of like a pop like not pop but like it's I hear like people who want to go to Bonnaroo who want to go for the experience which is really good but I've also so like the people that I originally went with in feels in a, like 2006 feel almost like it's kind of strayed from its roots in a way because it started off and like so I mean like it's good to be diverse and like the the festival is like always diverse but the way that it's changed it's almost like um, I've heard people say it's like become like more corporate and I've just noticed like the changes in center have become way like even though they're always geared towards the fans there's more like corporate sponsorship and. Uh, I know that goes along with like having bigger bands at the same time, but I don't know, what, what would your reaction well, to that be? Um, I mean, it's funny that you used the, the 06 year to talk about that. Yeah, that's kind of the first year that it changed though, because it was like Radiohead and... Right, yeah. um, you know, a lot of the people, well, let me, let, me, let me say that I understand totally what you're talking about. Um, we need to keep the event fresh, and that's first and foremost our, our, you know, pro, our mission you know, is to continue to have new things there, and yeah, to continue to sort of push the envelope of what can be there. We do very much still stick to one guiding thing, which is like, if we're gonna have a band there, they need to be a good live band. It's not about anything else um, other than them being able to put on a great performance. So take a band like Metallica. I mean, you can hate Metallica, that's fine. You can not like, you know, sort of have issues with you know, maybe some of the people that come to see them or have a perception of that, but they're a great live band. I mean, it's really hard, in my opinion, to say, well, that band, just, you know, they don't put it out. They put out, a, you know, crazy energy. So from our perspective, as long as we stick to the principle of let's put on great live bands and let's continue to sort of, you know, always, um, you know, try and reach new ground, try and ch even challenge the audience a little bit, that is there to open their minds to a lot of different things. You know, when we booked Radiohead that year, people, like, we had, I, I thought I, like, you know, killed somebody's dog or something. I mean, literally, we got, like, you know, all this, you know, people really pissed at us. And it was funny, because it was probably one of the greatest shows we've ever done. I think that there were so many people there that had never seen them before that, you know, totally changed their opinion of that band and, and even that kind of music. Um, and that's... To, to us, like one of the most exciting things to be able to do, uh, but you know, nothing nothing stays the same a in life, in you know your business, in anything. The, everything's in a constant state of change, and you know, as long as you do your you know you do what you're trying to do with good intentions, um, and you go with that change, you try and you know continue to diversify things and, and do better than you know. In our minds, it's success. If we were producing the same show that we did in 2003 or 2004, A, we'd be bored. B, no one, not, not anywhere near as many people would show up because, you know, get change, old. shit. Yeah, people change. Um, but I still believe that at the end of the day, the kind of people that are going to come to a four-day camping festival in the middle of Tennessee are the kind of people you want to be at at a four-day camping festival mm -hmm. in Tennessee. You know, it, it, everybody that shows up to Bonnaroo, you know, for the eight years that we've done it have been the kind of people that, you know, just want to have a good time. You know, want to want to want to party with their friends and, you know, want to get away from it all. Want to be outside of that normal experience of, you know, going home after a show and like having a, your TV there or whatever. You know, want to be fully immersed and, uh, you know. Uh, that's that's really what our goals are, and, and I think that we've stayed pretty true to that. All right. Um, could you just address though, like the, the like the corporate aspect or the? Um, I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this. Talking right. about sponsorship. Yeah, sponsorship. Involvement. Um, 
it's always been a part of Bonnaroo, actually. I mean, even, I would say from probably 04, 05, that it's, uh, it's been pretty, pretty consistent. Now, let me talk about that for a second, because I think it is an important part of what we do. And uh, it's always good to hear feedback that people think that it's too corporate because you know maybe we're not doing our jobs in that regard as best as we can be. Um, but one thing that I think that we've done well is that if you look at all of the corporate involvement in our event, it's always integrated. It's always involved in some aspect of the event. You know, there's no Bonnaroo presented by Oreos. I mean, there's no stage signage. Nowhere on any stage have you ever seen a corporate logo on bon a Bonnaroo. We just don't do it. We don't want to do it. We don't need to do it. You know, so that's like a line that we draw. It's like if you want to be a company that comes to Bonnaroo, we're gonna, you're either going to have an idea or we're going to help you create an idea of how you do something for the fans, how part of your involvement there adds something to the festival, something that wouldn't be there if you weren't there. And that's kind of how we did it. Take something like the silent disco there. Yeah, we've had a sponsor of that. I think it was Vitamin Water last year. I mean, they paid for that whole thing. Every year we've had it, we've had somebody come in and pay for it. It's really the only way you know, that we can afford to do it. So, um, you know, that's been our, our, our whole, you know, MO since the beginning, and it will continue to be. And, and I'm sure there are times when we do things that, you know, maybe step over the line a little bit, and hopefully people like you will, you know, keep us straight on it. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't even think you're overstepping the line. I just think I'm kind of nitpicky too. But um, sure, I just want to, like, as a fan, thank you. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially like you said, even with the sponsorships, like compared to other festivals I've been to, every time I've been to Bonner, the sponsors are always really like fan oriented. And that's our that's thing. that's what we're trying to do. Hopefully, you know, people recognize it. You know, we we see a lot of other festivals where it's all over the place and it's crazy, and it's like, okay, that's not what we're gonna do. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, man. Uh, you said a few minutes ago that one of the factors um, for whether or not a band is going to play is um, like if they can do a good live performance. Right. So what else do you look at besides just the live performance aspect? Well, certainly for the most part, bands are going to have to be at a certain level of uh, national audience and recognition to play Bonnaroo. We're not the you know the place to play <laughs> if you're just getting started and you're you know played you know 20 shows in your hometown. And people are digging it. it. It's just not, you know, really what what we're about. There's plenty of great places there, but we're, you know, sort of a, a next step or two above that. So, you know, most of the bands that play are national touring acts, you know, with at least, you know, probably a year or two of touring under their belt. Most of them are, um, you know, have have some uh, business behind them in a way. Uh, not always, but. I'd say 95% have, you know, a known manager, agent, you know, uh, or, or are on a label or something that, you know, sh shows that th this is a band that's going to, you know, sort of continue and, and they're in it for real and it's not just, you know, something that, um, you know, is just sort of starting to develop. Uh Again, with the uh, live band question, like, do you guys do any sort of, excuse me, field research? Like, do you guys fly out to Chicago or whatever, if that's where the band's from, and check them out, or? We go to a lot of shows. So, you know, usually someone in our world has seen, you know, a band. A lot of times it's, it's you know, having a network out there. You know, I know promoters all over the country, so. If I got to find out about something, you know, I'll send out an email to 20 or 30 guys and be like, have you guys had them? What do you think? Are they good? You know, obviously today it's really easy to like get online and check a ton of stuff out. So we don't, too, too frequently I won't go, I go to South by Southwest every year. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of bands there, no doubt about it. Uh, and I go to a lot of other festivals. Yeah. So inevitably catch a lot of stuff there and, and I just go to see a lot of shows. So. Uh, thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, you talked about um, booking like 3,200 people shows and then went to 70,000 people. So can you just kind of talk about the progression of how you went from like medium to like, large, like, extremely huge? It was, it was pretty instant. I mean, you know, we had this idea for Bonnaroo. 
Uh, we thought that there was, um, you know, a, a, a market for a large-scale camping festival, and we had no idea what it was going to do. First day, we put tickets on sale. I mean, I really remember clearly that, like, you know, we had no idea. We didn't spend any money advertising. We just put up our website and sent out email blasts and had all the bands do that. And we sold, like, 15,000 tickets the first day, and we were totally shocked. And then the next day, we sold, like, another 10,000 tickets. And within two weeks, we had sold 60,000 tickets. We went and bought another or rented another piece of property, sold another 10,000 tickets in an afternoon. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen that IBM commercial where, like, they're all sitting there, and they get their web store open, and they sell, like, 50 and 100 and, like, 2,000 and 5,000. And they're really psyched. And then it keeps on going, and they sell, like, you know, 20 million, and they're like, what the hell do we do now? <laughs> and that was kind of us. You know, we were like, and w there was one moment where we were really psyched, and then there was like another moment where it's like, okay, now we've got to really figure out how to do this thing. Uh, you know, we, we knew enough at that point about putting on shows in the business and going to festivals, um, and I'd worked at a few, of generally what needed to happen, but the real key for us was hiring really good people. I mean, there's still p the people that still work for us on the festival. We just, we got tapped into a group of people who were some of the top professionals in the business and really cared about it, and we treated them with the respect that they deserve. You know, I mean, they looked at us, most of them were in their, you know, early to mid 40s or 50s, and we were a bunch of kids in our, you know, 24, 25, and, you know, that could have been a situation where we were, came off too cocky or, you know, didn't handle them in the right way, and we were just really, I don't know why, but really cognizant of, like, listening to them knowing when to put our foot down about things, but just letting good people do their job. And we're, we're very fortunate. All right. What's the, what's the lowest profile uh, <laughs> One of the things we did at Bonnaroo uh, a couple years ago uh, was we decided to create little clubs there. Um, we call them cafe stages, and you know they're they're you know a place where maybe 150, 200, 300 people can watch a band. Um, and one of the reasons we did that was because we wanted to give smaller up-and-coming bands, you know, an opportunity there. Um, we also felt like anytime you're in a big environment, a big festival event, that you can get people to have small experiences at the same time as those larger ones, that that, you know, creates a lot of posit positive, uh, you know, things for an event. Um, so, I mean, we've had really small bands. You know, a lot of the smaller bands we do tend to book, um, you know, are from the region. You know, so, like, they're a band out of Nashville or Knoxville. But that, that's not always the case. You know, we've had, once again, most of those bands, even though, like, they're making a living doing it. That's what they're doing. Uh, you know, maybe not a good living, but they're, they're on the road, you know, you know. 50 dates a year, 75 dates a year. The, the, you know, they're, they're really giving a go to it. So, uh, but, but some of those bands can be really small. And it goes over great. We've, I mean, we've had bands, the coolest thing there is when a band starts at that level, do, has such a big response and buzz after the festival that we then put them in a bigger slot the next year and then a bigger slot the next year. I mean, I, one of the bands that's one of our, my favorite success stories, just because I'm a huge fan, is, uh, is My Morning Jacket. You know, we started with them uh, when they were really not a, not very many people knew about them in a small tent, and you know they've played our, our biggest stages. You know, and year after year, they just kept on getting bigger, and it was just because they they played amazing shows when they were there. So. It's the funnest part about it. 
I mean, it goes back to what I was saying when I originally started wanting to get involved in the business was just turning people onto new music. It's fun as hell. So we're lucky that that's what we get to do. All right. I think that's all the time we have for today. So thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.